Good evening. Welcome to Chatsworth Baptist Church this evening. It's great to see you here in the house of the Lord. We're going to start singing this evening number 109 in our hymn books. 109 as we get the service started. Great is thy faithfulness. We'll stand together and sing all three verses. 109. Amen. Take some time and greet one another.
Amen. Nothing like good fellowship, right? All right. Um, don't forget to look over things in your bulletin. We went over that this morning. Um, just Tuesday night, ladies meeting. Besides that, everything's in the future. So just keep an eye on things. Look at your calendar. And... All right. 430 as we continue singing this, this evening. 430 for our offertory hymn. Remain seated, we'll sing both verses, Lord I need you.
much. 491 as we continue singing this evening. 491, Does Jesus Care? We stand together and sing all three verses together. songs. You may be seated. <sighs> Amen. Uh, it's good to have Pastor Griffith back. Uh, I did not announce it this morning, but there's going to be plates by the back door if, to, uh, uh, if you want to donate to the ministry of Biblical Family Ministry. So, Pastor Griffith, it's wonderful to have you here. Come and minister to us. Good evening. Thanks for being back tonight. I want to pursue a little bit more the idea of facing the new year based on Paul's testimony. And it's always a blessing to know that God's men whose lives are recorded in the Bible uh, were just like us. They had their failures, their weaknesses, their struggles, their battles. And uh, that should help us and encourage us because so many times we see the way they lived, the victory they had, and the way they served. And that should be a reminder to us that by God's grace, uh, we can have victories. We can serve. We can see the Lord uh, do good things, hopefully in us and through us. And so this we can relate to tonight. 
Paul was sharing with us his testimony, as we noted this morning in his desire for the prize of the high calling of God, he said he needed to forget the things which were behind. And again, that means the idea of setting aside, refusing to acknowledge those things where we have come behind, those things where we have failed, where we have not been successful, where we've been defeated. We can't live back there. And if we do, it'll be a life of defeat. So if we need to confess, we confess. We need to make things right, we make things right. But then we refuse to let those things continue to haunt us and defeat us. We need to move forward, every single one of us. And that would be Paul's desire, and he's going to help us tonight to see what that meant to him, and therefore something of what it means to us. So take your Bible, open to Philippians 3, and I want to remind you of verse 12, and right on through verse 14, before we pray. Paul says, beginning in verse 12, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. What a great statement. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I hope we'll never become satisfied with where we are in life and realize that the Lord has something more for us. And we should yearn for that, long for that, strive for that. Lord, what do you want to do in my life? Why did you get hold of me? What's the purpose? What's your desire? I want it. I won't be satisfied until I can get more and more of it. There's an urgency about that. There's an excitement about that. And you and I should put ourselves right in that very situation. Bow together with me in prayer before we go any further. Our Father, we are grateful that we can be together tonight. And we pray that as we open your word, that your spirit would find liberty to work through the word of God, work in our hearts and our lives, equip us for the days that are before us. It is a new year. We thank you for it. We know that new year will bring both opportunities and challenges in the midst of it, Father, we want to lay hold of you and get hold of the reason you've called us to yourself, you've called us to serve you and live for you. Help us to learn from the testimony of the Apostle Paul. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. In verse 13, Paul said, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. We tried to focus on that this morning. We need to do that. But then he said, while I'm forgetting the things which are behind, I am, the next part of the verse, reaching forth unto those things which are before. You might have some kind of note in your Bible that suggests the idea of stretching yourself reaching forth, not being satisfied, but reaching forth unto the better things, the new things, whatever those things that are before, and all the time the goal being, I am going to press toward that goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You ever taken time to think of what it's going to be like that day we stand before the Lord? That ought to strike a little bit of terror in our souls to think that someday we'll stand before him I don't think it'll be an easy experience. We look forward to it, want to be with the Lord, love to have the Lord Jesus come back and, and take us up to be with him. But that time is going to come when each of us will stand personally before him. There'll be no one else to whom we can point and blame for our failures or our sins or our discouragements or whatever it might be. 
Everyone, Paul said in Romans 14, will give an account of himself to God. And if that doesn't stir you, I don't know what would stir you. Because most of the time we like to live finding some excuse for our failure or whatever else it might be. Paul yearned for that experience with this thought in mind. I'd like to receive the prize of the high calling. Can God possibly commend us? It's available. Well done. I wonder if any of us will hear those words. Well, look what Paul says. He's going to help us understand some things about the, this life and moving forward in it. And so in verse 15, he says this, Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect. Now, that's always a relative term. Nobody arrives. We are trying to walk through the maturing process. And hopefully, we're further along now than we were a year ago. And hopefully, next year, we'll be further along than we are today. But there's always a, a, a relativity about the term mature. Nobody's ever there. But there is that, that measure of maturity that we see. And so he's referring to people who have grown some, they've learned some, they're moving forward. He says, well, let us therefore as many as be perfect, as, as many as are in the maturing process, we've grown up to some degree, let us be thus minded. Now what's the thus minded referring to? Well, it's referring to verses 12, or excuse me, verses 13 and 14. He said, if you are mature, then I want you to think in harmony with what I've just presented. As I've given you my testimony that I have not arrived, I have not apprehended, I'm forgetting the things which are behind, I'm reaching forth to the things that are before. He said, I'm challenging you to look at your life in the same way. Then he goes on and says this, and if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Now, that's an interesting statement. Did you ever challenge somebody with kind of like, uh, well, you might not agree with me now, but when you get to heaven, you'll agree with me. Did you ever say anything like that, you know, teasing? Paul's trying to say, look, I'm trying to give you truth, and if there's somebody out there you don't agree, well, give it time, God will reveal this unto you. God will help you get it. And what his point is, is this, and you and I need to get hold of this. There is only one way to grow and mature, and it's the process that he has identified. You continue to set aside those things where you've failed and gotten discouraged, and then you continue to try to take the step forward to become what God wants you to be, and there is no shortcut in the process. And sometimes we wish there could be, but there is not. He goes on and says, verse 16, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained. Stop and think. What is it in my life that has helped me to grow? What is it in my life and experience that has brought me to some level of maturity. Well, there have been times in the Word, times of prayer, times of victory, times of trial. And each one of us could look back and perhaps put our finger on some things and say, you know, there was that experience in my life that really moved me forward. Or sitting under the Word of God, that has helped me grow. Or meeting with people for prayer. And Paul's point is going to be this. I want you to look at what brought you to where you are, the things that have brought you to where you have already attained. And then what's he say? Let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Simple statement. Keep going. Keep going. No shortcut to spirituality. 
no experience where God is all of a sudden going to send the kind of revival where in a moment your life has changed and you never have the struggle and burden again. The Christian life, one day at a time, one day at a time in the Word of God, one day at a time praying, one day at a time of fighting off the temptation, surrendering in the hard times, battling through on your knees with this book in hand, dealing with people, good and bad, whatever it is. So it's one day at a time. And the way you have gotten to where you are now has basically been that day-to-day -day experience of trusting walking, praying, and seeing God gradually bring you to maturity. There's no shortcut to maturity. And sometimes we'd like the shortcut. And I'm often careful when I talk about people who pray for revival, but often that, the attitude is this. Oh, if God would just you know, bring a revival, then everything would be fixed just like that. Everything would be great. If only God would do something dramatic. And I want to say it in the right way, but the Christian, not the experience of the dramatic and the experience and everything settled in one zapping from God. Christian life is one day at a time, hard work of surrendering, reading, obeying, and doing what God says to do. That's how you grow. That's how you learn. That's how you mature. It takes a lifetime. And that's why Paul could say he hadn't arrived, but he's going to keep going. Sometimes we can get discouraged and we can get defeated. But everything we go through allowed of God to keep us on the pathway of growth and learning and maturity. That's a challenge, isn't it? We'd like it to be a little easier. And the hard thing is that means that as we have at times gone through deep water, probably some more deep water to come. Hard times where people have let you down, probably going to be other people who let you down. Times when you fail and you feel miserable and you want to quit, probably be some other times to let you down. But the Christian life is that by the grace of God, you keep going. That's why it's important to learn that lesson of what it means to forget those things which are behind because if we let those things pile up, it can be pretty miserable in our lives because we fail a lot. But also that challenge of this, but I'm not going to settle for where I am. I want to keep stretching forth and reaching forth because as Paul's going to remind us in a moment, the day's coming when we're going to be with the Lord. Now notice what he goes on to say. Verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which so walk as you have us for an example. What's he saying? Watch and find people who walk day by day with Christ. See their life, see their testimony, and get on the bandwagon, as it were, and say, I want to live like that person lived. I want to get hold of what they have. Somebody outstanding in my life was my father-in-law. With the Lord now. But I grew up, as some of you know, in a broken home. And he became the first person that I could really think of as a dad. Steady, faithful, not the smartest man in the world, could teach a Sunday school lesson, not the greatest teacher in the world, but a man who just walked with God day after day, year after year. And I could look at him and learn from him. And God's got somebody in your life. And you can see there's 
that testimony. That's what Paul was saying. He was inviting them to follow him, but not just him. He was saying, and there's others. Follow that example. You'll see the hard times and the good times, but watch me. And then he contrasts that whole idea totally with what you and I see in the world among other people. Verse 18 says, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. There's a lot of those guys out there, aren't there? Making fun of Christ, making fun of you, mocking the things of God. But he says, whose end is destruction. You know where they're going unless they come to Christ. God is their belly. What's that mean? The belly refers to their appetites, the satisfying of themselves. All they want is what they want now. That's how they live. Just give me what I want right now. And they'll do whatever they have to do to get satisfied right then. Their God is their belly. Their glory is in their shame. You know, unsaved people who simply want to glory in the wickedness of their life. They love to tell you the stories of their sin, their corruption. And then they mind, they think about, they dwell on only the things of this world. Now that's the crowd out there without Christ. But verse 20, remember that verses 18 and 19 are in parenthesis. You see that? It's a little parenthetical statement. He steps away from his major argument and kind of gives us that parenthesis. But verse 20 is really a follow-up to verse 17, brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example, verse 20, for our conversation, that's an old English word, our citizenship, our home, where we really belong in contrast to those who only mind earthly things, our conversation is in heaven. That's home. And that's why we're on this walk, this steady walk, this day-by-day -day walk, growing, learning, serving, ever mindful of this. Heaven is home. And then he goes on and says this. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you live. You live looking. You live looking for Christ. You live trying to grow, but ever looking for Christ. And every single one of us have already given thought to this. Might he come back this year? 2016, maybe. What will happen when he comes back? Verse 21, who shall change our vile body, this body of humiliation of ours that causes us so much trouble? This body of sickness, this body of pain, this body of death. He's going to change that body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, a body of dignity and honor according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Look at the goal he's setting for us. You're entering a new year. I'm entering a new year. There's some things I need, I need to put behind me, things I need to let go of. I don't want to live back there. But now we start a march through a new year. Day by day, one day at a time. Desiring to grow, desiring to change, to become more and more what God wants me to be, and ever mindful of this, and he's coming back. He's coming back. Might be this year, don't know, but he's coming back. Heaven is home. And then Paul's going to move, and we're not going to spend much time with it, but then Paul's going to move to some very practical challenges about this, very practical challenges. And he introduces those challenges to us in the next chapter with the word, what? Therefore. You see, he's given us a lot of truth. He's given a, a lot of things to think about, and now he's going to build on that. He's going to say, therefore. With all that that I've just told you, 
there's some things you need to do. There's some ways you need to live. And what you're going to notice is there's nothing dramatic about it. It's steady, day-by-day -day experience, dealing with people, dealing with problems, dealing with self. That is the Christian walk. It's the steadiness and stability of living one day at a time for Christ. So he says, therefore, on the basis of all I've told you, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. That's a simple exhortation, isn't it? That's what you need to do. Stand fast. Instability is not valuable in the Christian walk. Being up and then down and then up and then down and happy and sad. No, it's not the way we're supposed to live. Stand fast. Don't move away from him. Stand fast in the Lord. Interesting, he has a word for some people who were struggling with each other. Verse 2, I beseech Odeus and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And the implication is they were having trouble with each other. Now, you've never had any trouble with anybody, have you? Well, my little note is a warning against the, the tension and stress that comes when we have to deal with each other. And it does come. Can be in the family, can be in church, can be at work. But his exhortation here, particularly to these two ladies who were obviously in the same church, boils down to this. Don't quarrel. Don't quarrel. You know, most of the times when there's quarreling, it's over dumb things, stupid things. Now, I'm not going to get in trouble because I know who selected the carpet for the church. And there's not going to be any debate about it. How many of you know what color is coming? Raise your hand. Oh, I know what color is coming. A couple. The rest of you don't know. You're going to be surprised. It's a beautiful pink. It's a hot pink of color. <laughs> what is it? A little purple in it. Polka dots kind of. You know, those are the kinds of things that can cause trouble, can't they? The color of the color. Well, I would have put this. Well, I would have. Be thankful you're going to have company instead of that crazy stuff. But that's the kind of dumb things that happen. I don't know what these ladies were battling about. They were, something was going on. I don't know what it was. Paul said, will you get it together, please? Be of the same mind. Stop quarreling. Stop, stop uh, you know, uh, being unkind to each other. Rejoice in the Lord, he's going to say in a few moments. You don't do well living for Christ if you're always having these squabbles. In verse 3, he said, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also, with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Help them. Stay at it. You were laborers with me. Keep laboring. I would say don't quit. Too many quitters. You know anybody that quit last year? They're not serving now. Maybe they're not coming now. They're not reading their Bible now. They're not praying now. Don't quit. Lord Jesus is coming back. You're entering a new year. Don't give up. Don't quit. He goes on. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Because he never fails. Don't fret. Don't fret about people. Don't fret about situations. Verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Your moderation, your gentleness, uh, being easy to get along with. Are you easy to get along with? Shall I take that vote? No, I better not. Well, it would be fun to see how many of you think you're easy to get along with. I wonder how many hands. Oh, yeah, I'm easy to get along with. I wonder. Some people aren't. You've, you've met them. None of us, but you've met that crowd. He said, let your moderation be known unto all men. Be easy to get along with. Be easy to be entreated. And the challenge is don't be a reactionary person. Verse 6, very practical. 
More familiar text. Be careful for nothing. Stop worrying. Stop being defeated by those things that cause the stress and the tension. Be careful for nothing. And he says, here's what you need to do about it. In everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Stop worrying. Be a prayer warrior. Thank God for what's going on in your life. And here's the promise, verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, these simple things are part of this reaching forth to grow in Christ. Stretching yourself forward spiritually. And then he hits the last one because in verse 10 he's going to go a different direction. But verses 8 and 9, one of the great keys to spiritual victory and spiritual growth is what goes on in this mind. And what defeats so many people is what goes on in this mind. And so he says to us, as a part of this discussion, verse 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, that whole list, powerful list, but he qualifies it, if there be any virtue in those things, moral excellence is the challenge. And if there be any praise, things that will bring praise to God, think on these things. You cannot grow in Christ and you cannot serve Christ if you are defeated in your mind. If you are defeated in your thinking processes, you're thinking the wrong things. Maybe immoral things, ungodly things, maybe defeating things, the negative things. You can get away from people, you can never get away from this. We carry it with us every day, all the time. We're thinking, we're thinking, we're thinking, and it can destroy us and destroy our testimony. And Paul says, take responsibility for your thinking. Don't become a victim of your thinking. God comes to us and says, look, there's some things, don't think about them. Now, we live in a world that is so out of control. People say, well, I can't control my thinking. God calls on us to control our thinking. I want to tell you, that's where victory and growth is. He goes on in verse 9. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do... Follow that testimony, and the God of peace shall be with you. Is 2016 going to be a better year than 2015? Economically, it might not be. Politically, I don't know what's going to happen. For this church, I don't know what's going to happen. But can we sit here tonight and say, it's going to be a better year for me. In my walk with Christ, it's going to be a better year. My devotion to Christ, it's going to be a better year. Growing in Christ, it's going to be a better year. I'm going to sell out to him. I'm going to surrender to him. I'm going to live for him. Now, may the pressures be great, maybe greater than they were on us last year? Yes. But none of those things have to take us down. Whether we grow, whether we learn, whether we mature, whether the year is victorious, ultimately comes down to whether we do what Paul tells us to do, and what he tells us to do is available equally to every single one of us. Paul had no corner on spirituality, no corner on growth. He was sharing here in the early part of the verses what he was doing. And then he basically turned to us and said, and that's what you need to do. Did you grow last year? Will you grow 
this year. Let's pray. Our Father, I pray that you would deliver every single one of us from spiritual stagnation where we just exist, we get by, we survive. Father, that's not what we witness in the life and testimony of the Apostle Paul. We sense a spiritual excitement in his life to actively put away those things that had defeated or discouraged and to actively pursue a pathway of growth. Pursuing that goal, that prize, and mindful that the Lord Jesus could come at any time. Father, we confess sometimes we just get discouraged. We lose our zeal. But that's not good enough. And I pray you'd put a burning desire in every single one of us to be faithful in the year ahead, to be fruitful, to be a testimony to unsaved people and to be a testimony to other believers around us, to be delivered from the, the quarreling or the complaining, the things that not only take us down, but take others down too, will deliver us from the defeat of wrong thinking, wrong actions. Father, I pray you'll grant to us a great year in our walk with you. The pressures will just drive us closer to you. And we'll witness your work in our own hearts and lives as well as others. Father, don't let us be the same this coming year as we were last year. Move us forward for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Griffith. You take your hymn books and turn to 368. We're going to sing the third verse from the song we sang this morning. Look at the words of the third verse, and it says, Lead me in thy perfect way. Thy command shall always guide me. Rather fitting for what we just heard.